Welcome to the Futurist Freelance Podcast, brought to you by Zolo, the operating system for the solo economy. Every week, we're serving up an audio cocktail of expert tips, inspired insights, and stories from the frontiers of freelancing to help you grow your borderless business to new heights and live life on your own terms. So kick back, grab a snack, let's get started. There are many amazing content creators in the Zolopreneur network, but not many of them find themselves documenting war crimes as part of their work. Today, we share with you a powerful interview with Oris Soub from Lviv, who has pivoted his entire business and formerly nomadic lifestyle to bring you real local stories about the impact of the war in Ukraine. Operating entirely independently, unconstrained by journalistic conventions and the pursuit of headlines and sound bites, Oris Local Knowledge provides a unique perspective on one of the key geopolitical events shaping our time. And as well as the vital work he's doing right now, I found Oris' constructive and optimistic take on the future for Ukraine incredibly refreshing too. There was never a stronger endorsement of our key thesis that freelancing is the future. So enjoy the interview. And if you're inspired to take action and follow and support Oris' work, you'll find all the links you need in the show notes. So welcome, Orest. It's fantastic to have you here at the Future is Freelance podcast. Uh, you're coming to us from Lviv in Ukraine, and we'll come to talk about that very shortly. But first of all, I'd really like to take you back to the time before everything changed in February and discover a little bit more about what life was like for you as a freelancer back in the day. Could you paint a picture for us so that we can start to understand how much has changed lately? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. So uh, I'm originally from Ukraine and my native city is Lviv. Uh, however, as the remote free um, online entrepreneur, that's probably a better word to describe my, my activity because I'm not limited to freelance only. I also do hiring. I have some contractors and I am mostly relying in my business activities on uh, recurring revenue uh, models. So that's probably like a few steps ahead of freelancing, even though in my professional career, I used to be a freelancer for a couple of years as well. And generally, I am in uh, this online marketing uh, and all this all the related uh, niches uh, since 2011. So uh, pretty long time ago. And uh, my my dream, yes, and my dedication, why I actually I came to this industry was... Um, the wish to travel the world, to see the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the tools, uh, as I found later, is simply online work, right? Uh, Once you uh, work online, you are able to do this remotely from uh, any part of the world. And thanks to that, uh, at the moment, I have visited already, like we precise, 129 countries around the world. Yeah. How many have you not visited? There can't be many left for your list. (laughs) Uh, we we can go deep, like it's rather a travel topic right. already and the geography. But um, like big travelers, they uh, keep the number of 123, which is the official number of the United Nation uh, members, right? Okay. You would say that then prior to February this year, you probably lived a life of a fairly typical online entrepreneur, funding your travels with passive income whilst you got to choose where you lived and worked. But I imagine that the whole idea of that freedom took on a very different perspective from Mm. February. So please explain to us how your work has pivoted and what you're spending your time on now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I had an amazing life, you know, like six months traveling around, uh, managing my team remotely, uh, doing what I love and which is profitable. So it's simply amazing stuff. Uh, So yeah, but uh, when um, in February 24th, uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, we, uh, you know, became a country in war, and I decided by myself that I'm going to participate in the resistance and do everything I can in order to contribute uh, f- towards our future victory and towards uh, defending the fundamental uh, liberal Western values uh, that are the essence of this war in general. Yes, yeah? so it's not only about Ukraine; it's about the. Um, it's like, you know, this is one of those um, yeah. examples, like unique examples in the human history 
when it's you can clearly draw a line between a dark and light between a good and bad and uh, i sincerely believe that ukraine is the front line of the good things in the world at the moment and that's why we are enjoying such tremendous uh, unprecedented support from from the entire of the civilized and free world mm-hmm. uh, so uh, i thought like okay like w- what am i going to do and uh, i i must say that uh, i kind of knew it's coming because just one week before the war started i was traveling so i intentionally came to ukraine before the attack happened just four days uh, to stay here and to participate because in 2014 when ukraine was living through our previous uh, revolution yes um, when we lost part of uh, like uh, the eastern part the donbas and the crimea was annexed uh, i was uh, like this like i was a typical digital nomad yeah. Uh, spending my uh, summer uh, winter time in Mexico, sorry. So uh, I really feel bad being on the distant and uh, feeling helpless and anxiously watching all the news. So it was my clear intention to be in Ukraine and to participate in the local movements uh, during the war. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, if you ask me now uh, where I would like to be, uh, I feel like it's the most right place at the moment completely busy every day and uh, staying side by side with other peers, with my colleagues and our entire nation. So uh, what I, what I did, yes, when it started, I must say I was kind of not prepared, but at least I knew exactly what am I going to do if this happens. Yes. And uh, considering that uh, our team was well organized before, like remotely, I mean, uh, we were mostly focused on different consulting, online marketing topics, producing content. Uh, however, like 95% of our clients, and our market was the Ukrainian based. Uh, so we, we decided to use our expertise uh, simply on the global market. Uh, I am fluent in English, as, as you can see, although I have an accent and uh, I should improve in this case. Oh, I don't know. Your English is excellent. Yeah, thank you. It's still uh, sufficient to spread the message uh, through the entire world. And since we have, you know, the uh, professions, we have the tools, uh, we started to inform uh, the global uh, society about the events in Ukraine from the local perspective. So I engaged also my entire international network uh, of friends, colleagues, uh, some of them like uh, business partners and so on, to do this first push Mm -hmm. uh, about, uh, you know, the, the, the events here. And then it's spread out. So um, every day I spend approximately three to four hours inter- on the interviews like this uh, with different communities uh, or like media channels or our other organizations, like from Taiwan, Japan, all the way to California, uh, which means uh, not sleeping uh, properly because of different time belts. Yeah. But that's like the least I can do. Uh, also, we started a completely new YouTube channel in English mm-hmm. language. And I am personally visiting some uh, some hotspots that most people would never consider going there, uh, just to show the uh, the insight and to show the real truth what's happening. So a couple of days ago, I came back from the newly rebel- liberated territories in the north of Ukraine. Uh, you know, I'm talking about Bucha. I'm talking about villages around. Uh, I was present when uh, you know those of you know, dead bodies have been taken out from the from the ground. Uh, I spoke to different local families who lost uh, some of friends or, or relatives. Like those are really terrifying stories, but uh, it's important to tell it. And um, in my approach, I'm not trying, and our team is not trying to compete with the international media, which simply work on the level of loud headlines and showing the same pictures, the, sh- the same terrifying videos uh, for like thousands of times. Yeah. Uh, I would say I go a little bit deeper. Uh, for those people who are hooked on the news topic and then they want to understand things more. So I am like, even like from the marketing perspective, I'm working on the like middle level, uh, you know, like, because first you have like, you you uh, try to catch the attention. That's what the biggest news are making. And then you, you, you build the relations. So I am on the level of building relations and uh, I understand that uh, it's not going to take the same coverage as the the loud headlines, but that's not my war. Uh, my job is to uh, explain things, 
is to show the local perspective and to be this uh, educator uh, to to show the real stuff uh, from Ukraine. And uh, we are doing our best in this sense. Yeah, yeah I think um, it's a really amazing and valuable perspective because on our news screens in, in the rest of Europe and the world, we see coverage from the BBC, from ITN, from CNN, from the big global organizations who are doing a very specific job of bringing us, as you say, the headlines, trying to give us the big strategic picture of what's going on. But I think the work you're doing on the ground of spending time with individuals, not for a three second soundbite, but really talking to them, drawing out stories from people who probably never would speak to the global media, but have such passionate individual stories to share. Do you feel that this is something that's shifted recently? I wonder what your thoughts are about the role of individual citizen journalists and content creators like yourself in just telling the world what's going on. Do you feel you can get places that the big news organizations can't? Or what makes what you're doing so powerful and unique? Um, I, I would say because I've seen how the uh, big like news reporters are working because, yeah, you know, we, I was living in the same hotel with BBC, mm. CNN recently. And uh, I've seen, uh, like I was, uh, for example, I traveled to Chernihiv, which is the city all the way back in the north. Uh, and we had to go there with the military convoy because it's still a hard place to reach. So they gathered all the journalists, yeah. we sit in the car and then we just simply drive, you know, through the like ruined bridges and so on. Um, I would say like this, uh, the job of big uh, news is to create the awareness of things and to mm -hmm. push on the most sensitive uh, parts of the soul uh, and heart. So, for example, if like somebody in New York City is having a coffee and reading the news and he's seeing, seeing like this uh, poor lady who is crying in front of her ruined house, he starts thinking like, oh, like I, I should speak to my friends and maybe we should push our um, senator, you know, to do something. So this is like the first step, mm -hmm. what they do on the massive scale. Uh, then... Uh, but but uh, and my uh, case is like when I come, first of all, I represent the local people here, right? So yes. so I have better understanding of the situation, and I go way beyond a picture of a devastated village. And uh, what also I started to do is I speak to the local organizations, and in my featuring materials, I do provide the picture. I explain more where is it located how it happened that the Russian troops went there. And then I also create the call, the exact call to action. If you want to help those people, this is the organization. Please contact them and provide support directly. Right. So uh, international journalists, in order to um, create the most objective uh, story and picture, they don't particularly point what people should do right now. They just create the picture and the society is you know, reconsidering it. Uh, since I'm local and since I don't, uh, I'm not dependent on any news, I don't have, I don't depend on any censorship. I'm an independent blogger. Yes, I am free to do whatever I want. And obviously, uh, I try to be as helpful as possible. And if I am on the, on the ground, if I see what's happening there, and if I speak particularly with some organizations uh, there, like in Chernihiv, and I see that, they are repackaging stuff or what really they need. I tell, I've been here. I spoke to those people. Here is the link. Please help them. Like that's uh, the the impact I'm trying to make at the moment. Yeah, it's an incredible twist on content marketing to find yourself essentially documenting war crimes and talking to people at the very heart of what's going on. And I agree, obviously, the international news media can't give that call to action. And actually... It's frustrating as a consumer of news in an independent country often to get to the end of these pieces on the media and not know how to help, not know what to do next when you're so outraged and distressed. So that's where you come in. Another thing that I would like to add is that if there are, if there are like, let's say, not in-house reporters, but the freelance reporters, yes? So they come on the field, they take mm -hmm. pictures, they speak to people, and then they have to create particular type of material that other medias will yeah. buy from them so the medias tell okay you got like only two minutes editing time and you have to frame everything you can do in those two minutes so in those two minutes 
they will show absolutely the worst. Yeah. Uh, and I understand because that's what clicks, that's what makes the views, and that's what makes the money to the media. So since I'm not limited uh, for these uh, frameworks, I can go beyond this. And uh, when I was even was traveling with the journalists, I've seen like, look, guys, uh, the historical part of Chernihiv, which is the ancient Ukrainian city, actually survived. You know, so there are churches that, that are like 900 years old. They're still standing. People go to pray there, even though there is no food or their house will be ruined. So they don't show that there is the hope for the life to be mm-hmm. restored. They show like the, the devastated part of the town. And uh, uh, I am, uh, you know, naturally, I'm a very positive thinking person. So even in this, for many people, hopeless situation, I still see like the churches functioning, you know, that the first shop have been opened in town. Yeah. Or I was in Kiev in the capital. I went, I found like a, 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 a pub where I could have the IPA beer, you know. Those are very important news for me, but nobody cares in the classic media world about this. And I also try to present this. Yeah, and it, it's not the story, is it? It's not the big news headlines. Yeah, it's, it doesn't make a story, yeah. But actually, as a consumer of that news media, it's awful to say but you just become inured to the bombed buildings and the endless night after night just seeing the devastation. And what when you bring that human perspective to it, and show us the lone church still standing or the community coming together to do something, it actually renders the devastation coverage a lot more impactful. So it's a shame that the big news media can't slow down and do the kind of coverage that you're doing. But maybe they couldn't anyway. Maybe it needs somebody who speaks the local language natively, who can build those relationships with people who may feel they've been let down by other countries and don't want to talk to their media or feel that they've got a very specific message or angle to get across. But what you're getting to is the really human stories. And that's so powerful. Yeah, I just try to be myself and uh, I show and uh, transfer uh, what I think is important, right? Uh, I'm not trying to play the game uh, of of others, mm-hmm. uh, there will be like a lot who want to do this, and that's absolutely fine. You know, there are different roles in this uh, in this world. Uh, I just do what I believe I'm good at and what uh, makes sense to me. Yeah, well, that's what's so powerful about this incredible democracy of content that we have now, isn't it? That you are a part of. Um, I'd like to shift and talk a little bit about Estonia and your e-residency there and how you feel that's helped you to carry on with the work that you're doing. Has it made things easier financially or logistically or what's what's the impact of that? Uh, absolutely. So uh, I'm the e-resident of Estonia since the last two years. And my initial aim to subscribe, yeah, to become the uh, e-resident was to get access to the global uh, payment system because Ukraine was still kind yeah. of apart uh, from that. Uh, So this particularly helped me to organize a recurring um, revenue model in my business. You know, I I did the combination of uh, Xolo, these international services, all the payments. Mm -hmm. It it became like really, really well. I I couldn't reach that level of uh, automation with Ukrainian uh, services. Um, Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, So that was working well. And uh, when uh, the war happened... um, banking system in Ukraine started to struggle. Also, uh, I lost like 90% of my business in Ukraine, yes. However, having the registered company in Estonia gave me access to uh, be able to uh, receive payments from uh, other like my uh, organizations abroad. And uh, I present my media activity now in many cases as the marketing service. So if they like, they tell, okay, or I want to pay you somehow, how, how can I do this? Yes, we organize the marketing services with them. And that's the way, uh, the, one of the ways yeah. I, I can receive the money. Uh, secondly, uh, what we are doing is that since I have this like endorsement and I have a large audience, uh, I cooperate with uh, e-residents uh, directly. So basically, we had some uh, contracts with them to promote uh, e-residency right. in Ukraine. And when this war also happened, they didn't let, let us down. They understand that uh, Ukraine is very, very important market for them. And I believe uh, before the war, Ukrainians were constituting the fourth largest uh, nation within all the e-residents. 
And uh, I believe uh, it's, I mean, it's not the game of numbers, but um, if there would be the aim, like they're required, like probably like thousand more e-residents and Ukraine will be the largest e-resident nation within the program, right, itself. So uh, I am promoting, uh, I am promoting e-residency here in Ukraine as I have personal experience with that. Solo, the company, they uh, um, provided like the option for Ukrainian companies with the free support, which is also the tremendous help. And uh, there is like a really, really powerful uh, message behind this because since the you know local economy sank in Ukraine, uh, many people just lost the job, you know, or they lost the clients, they lost contracts, and so on. Yeah. So um, having the company in Estonia gives uh, Ukrainian consultants, like some media professionals, freelancers, advertisement specialists, access to the global market, and uh, yes. that's the way how they can continue providing their services globally. And also, you know, sustaining themselves, sustaining their ha- families, and also be useful to Ukraine, you know, donating here or support other yeah. initiatives. So uh, yeah. I see uh, the role of e-residency for many Ukrainian uh, freelancers and remote companies as the bridge uh, to the rest of the of the rest of the uh, corporate mm. world and simple uh, and the much simplified process. Uh, in order to make transactions, uh, contracts, uh, positioning, and everything else. Because, uh, I mean, we cannot be let alone, yes, in this war, and that's a really great tool uh, to do it. Uh, I, I I tell this not in favor for e-residency or our like podcast. Uh, I am a user of e-residency. It helped me yeah. a lot, and I am transparently mm-hmm. recommend this to everybody in Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, really powerful testimony. I'm wondering too about the role of the e-residency status for displaced people. There's something about having that continuity, whether whether you have a business or not, simply knowing that you have that e-residency status that you could take with you if you have to leave Ukraine fast and you don't maybe even know where your final destination of settlement is going to be. At least you have that transnational identity, documentation and existence of some kind and the possibility to take your business with you, to take your finances with you. It's amazing. So, mm-hmm. Uh, f- first of all, it's important to understand that uh, e-residency is, has nothing to do with the immigration laws. Absolutely. Yes, let's clear that up. Uh, or the, you know, like the, uh, yeah, or like voting rights or, or, or other stuff. Yeah, so this is rather uh, a corporate right, a corporate right to sign different contract, conduct like open and close companies uh, virtually, not with necessity to travel to this country. So if the person mm-hmm. is displaced with, with their residence from Ukraine to Poland or you know, Turkey or any other country, uh, they still can keep their com- the company yeah. in Estonia. And uh, this doesn't make any obstacles for them uh, for the necessity to re-register it, move it somehow and so on. So that's, uh, you know, that's that's something what uh, is uh, really important nowadays in the mobile yeah. world. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. And I'm sure that nobody in the residency department envisaged this particular use case when they set it up. But you know, there are millions of people displaced from Ukraine and spreading across Europe. It's wonderful to think how many of those are taking Estonian businesses with them, e-resident businesses, which can continue to support them and their families and send funds back into Ukraine as well. I want to stress out uh, at the moment while we are talking, we reach the point when, just think about this, over 5 million Ukrainians left wow. the country. So we're talking about like 5 million refugees within like a little bit over a month. Uh, you know, Syria, which was the, the mm. second largest humanitarian crisis happened in the recent uh, decades, uh, like 7 million in 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here we're talking about 5 million in a little bit over a month. It's a completely different scale. Yeah, it's, it's a huge scale. It's like five Estonias. Sorry to to do this comparison, but it's still a lot, yeah. Yeah, no, that's very powerful. I know that some of them have made it to Spain already. There there are new people settling in the community where I live, and often they're bringing digital skills with them, um, businesses and 
Obviously, the EU has made it possible for people to work and receive state support. I think it's for at least a year. E-residency department are still waiving the registration fees and solo are waiving fees. So it's a really powerful way to funnel that support, hopefully, to the people who need it most. And maybe some of those five million will come back. I hope that they will. Oris, what are your personal hopes and dreams and fears for the future? You're closer to this than anyone I've spoken to. What's going to happen in Ukraine, do you think? And what's going to happen to all those people? So at the moment, we have war, right? Which means like mm-hmm. tanks, uh, rockets, planes, uh, hundreds of deaths every day. Yeah? So the, the number mm-hmm. one is to, uh, to finish the war. Yeah? Obviously, there can be different condi- conditions how it will be finished. And there are different scenarios. So the most favorable scenario for us is completely restoring the Ukrainian integrity uh, with the borders uh, before 2013. Uh, that's what everybody is working on. And uh, it proved to be that the Ukrainian army is having like tremendous success. You know, like yeah. uh, the entire world didn't even expect us to resist so hard and to have such successes. And uh, as I told you, I just came a couple of days ago from the liberated areas in the north. So uh, uh, we are talking about a huge area. They simply pushed back the Russian army. Now there are some fierce fighting in the south and east. Uh, However, we are continuing to receive more and more heavy military equipment from the Western countries. And uh, I believe uh, it's possible uh, to push back. I'm not the military strategist. Uh, But uh, uh, now uh, we don't need to prove uh, our capabilities. And uh, eventually, when this war will be finished, Ukraine will uh, appear to be one of the strongest uh, military nations uh, in the world because uh, not a single NATO country has such uh, valuable experience as Ukrainian army has, right? Mm. If you think about this, like uh, it it never, it was always like a, a theory. Like this is now the real uh, the real practice we are happening. Also today, I read on the news that the first part of the application to 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 join your, the European Union have been filled uh, by the Ukrainian mm. government. Uh, also, it have been announced that Ukraine will be is welcome in the European Union. Uh, the um, president of the European Commission uh, visited Ukraine uh, like a week ago. And we start receiving more and more guests as the top leaders from other European countries. So the outcome of the war, in my opinion, should be restoring the integrity of Ukraine, uh, joining uh, the European Union, uh, Union uh, joining uh, NATO, obviously. And uh, this will become the eventually the integral part of the entire civilized world and the European community. And uh, I think uh, nobody is standing for the core values that European Union was built as Ukrainians at the moment. So we really Mm. deserve this, uh, which means that once we will be back all together in a single community, Ukraine uh, will probably um, enjoy a tremendous economic growth because a lot of funds uh, will be sent to the restoration of our country. Uh, It's it's a huge market. It's a huge country with uh, a lot of population. So uh, it means like we will be simply merging with the rest of European society. And uh, from the historical point of view, uh, if we are thinking in terms of, you know, centuries, not uh, months, how we are thinking mm-hmm. now, it's a positive process. That's that's what I, uh, I I realize. Uh, the, the only problem here is that the price is very high uh, to get there, but that's probably the price we have to pay. Yeah, well, I, yes, we can sincerely hope um, that that price doesn't get too far out of hand and that what we've seen demonstrated through your coverage and the other world media of the Ukrainian people's strength and resilience um, in countering this is clearly what's going to see you through. What about yourself and your organization? Or do you see yourself going back to the more traditional forms of online marketing or do you think you'll stay in this kind of documentary making and storytelling role um, as the exciting future of Ukraine unfolds? Uh, Well, yeah, also I have some plans what to do. And um, I would say that uh, the position I'm taking now uh, is coinciding with uh, uh, like my own professional uh, growth and to do what Mm. personally I feel is important. uh, And also like which is contributing to the much uh, bigger general picture. Yes. So, um, 
first of all, uh, I'm not sure how will the internal market work because as it, like 5 million Ukrainians left and probably mm-hmm. uh, th- this is like a push to all the entrepreneurs in Ukraine enter the global market, which is also, it's like, like you know, Estonia. Like there is not really a big market in Estonia in itself, right? Uh, Ukraine mm-hmm. is still a much bigger country, but uh, this now, this is the chance uh, to become, uh, for local entrepreneurs to become much more effective and to become much more open-minded in terms of uh, global market in general. Because before the war, Ukraine had like 44 million people, which is a huge market on itself. So mm-hmm. there was not really a need <laughs> to go there, even though we, we know uh, many successful global companies from Ukraine. So I see that uh, I will be transferring my expertise to the global market uh, in terms of, um, like you asked me in the very beginning, the freedompreneur, yeah? And that's mm-hmm. like the topic and the, uh, the question that was always like somewhere deep in my heart. I'm talking about, you know, entrepreneurship, like being able to, yeah. to, uh, to create something with your skills, with your knowledge. I'm talking about uh, freedom, geographical, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of creativity. And uh, once, and it was always somewhere there. I always thought about the combination of words, free entrepreneurship, freedompreneurship, and so on. And when uh, this war happened, and like what we are fighting now for is freedom, right? Uh, I see that uh, I know how to put how to put the dots together in order to make a project which will be entrepreneurial, which will be uh, helping people to become more free in their life, mm-hmm. business, expression, and other activities, which will uh, first of all uh, make an impact in Ukraine, but also that will be uh, globally potential. What I'm talking here is uh, that after we are done with Ukraine, after we do the restoration, uh, this will be scalable uh, towards other developing nations, helping them to become more free uh, in terms of money and in terms of their personal values as well. Uh, The way to do it, as I see it, is the platform where uh, local people in those countries, in developing countries, here we are talking about in Ukraine, they get like uh, some skills to get a remote job, you know, like different types of remote jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, The entry level there will be get the English language until at least upper intermediate level. So first they learn English, then they get the necessary skill, and then they get matched with the global employers. And that part also I can cover because I have a large network of friends about online, uh, among online entrepreneurs and other digital nomads who are willing to help. So I'm pretty sure this will this will uh, um, hopefully will be successful, uh, which will simply create value for for both sides and for society in general. And that project, which is scalable uh, beyond Ukraine, so uh, I kind of mm. have this vision at the moment. Uh, and uh, like on the second month of the war, once like all the basic processes, uh, sa- like life saving uh, parts are covered. Yes, uh, we are putting our team together, uh, uh, developing this idea. So I think uh, you will hear more about this uh, soon. Yeah, let's see how it works. That's fantastic. And e-residency here like, will also be beneficial because yeah. most of the... Uh, documenting part will be going through my uh, Estonian company. Yeah. yeah, and that's what's going to give people access to that global market as they rebuild locally. Uh, I think that's an incredibly powerful and really inspiring vision, particularly coming at the moment when clearly the, you're still very much in the heart of the conflict. It's it's wonderful to have that that clear vision to look forward to for coming out of the other side of it. it. I'm certainly feeling very inspired by this conversation anyway. And we're not CNN or the BBC, so we're going to have a call to action. Oris, what's the best way for people to support you, to follow you, and to keep up with your amazing work? So first of all, uh, you have to understand, guys, that this is a war. yeah, And uh, especially at the war against Russia, where the only language they understand is brutal power, uh, the, the military strength strength is the this is decisive uh, like level right uh, not, not no entrepreneurship no social standards yeah. will work 
if Russia will win this war. So the priority number one is army. So we are going to provide links, yeah. yes, to this podcast. And the link number one will be simply support our army, which means donate financially to the army so the army can uh, can buy all the heavy equipment necessary uh, to win the war on itself. Yes. Uh, number two, uh, I would encourage you to support mm-hmm. directly me and my team because since I told you we lost like 90% of the business, and uh, my job, my job as the uh, like the leader of the team is first of all to keep the things up and running. Uh, my members of my remote team they live in different parts uh, of the country. Uh, one girl fled abroad, and uh, I still didn't cut their their payment since the day one of the war. So uh, these funds are also very. It's amazing. How many people? Five people. Five people. Five in my people. Team. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you need to fundraise to just keep them absolutely paying their bills yeah. and buying food and yeah. Yeah. So we do them. that, and since we don't make direct sales uh, directly as we did mm. before yes so this like serve as the funds to sustain uh, the company on itself and yeah. uh, that we're using to create and promote the media materials that we are working to spread the word yes and uh, yeah. i see this media material that we are doing as the multiplier uh, to make an impact because we talk about other organizations in ukraine and uh, make the direct connections to them so if you watch yeah. the materials just if you feel that among those materials I'm producing, there are some organizations that resonate to you, that maybe, you know, are closer to what you feel, uh, consider directly uh, donating mm. to them as well. Yes, and forming those connections and social media and just seeing what's going on in, in the ground in Ukraine. Uh, we will include all the links to all of your social channels in the show notes for this episode. Are there any, for anybody who's just listening and doesn't have access to the show notes, what should people search for you what's what's the main channels that you're active on oh that's pretty easy uh, simply uh, search my name orest zoop like orest like forest without f easy to remember and zoop z-u-b yeah so i'm present in instagram facebook and youtube mm-hmm. uh, everywhere i do in english language uh, so instagram uh, private facebook and a newly formed youtube channel is in english language yeah. also i have my former channels in ukrainian but those like different messaging to our local audience in ukraine so or zoop google me very easy You'll find it quickly. Brilliant. There's only one or a soup, and we'll put all those links into the notes so that you can click straight through and support this vital work um, in whatever way you feel the most appropriate. Now, in the meantime, then, it's, it's only remains for me to thank you, Oris, for taking the time to talk to the future as freelance today and sharing the information about the vital work that you're doing. And on behalf of everyone connected with the show, we just want to wish that you stay safe and productive and active. And I hope that at some point we'll be able to get you on later in the year to update us and hopefully the situation will be starting to resolve itself in some concrete direction. I think what you're planning to do after the war is also very exciting and powerful. And I really hope to be telling that story sometime in the future. For now, though, Just thank you very much. Absolutely. So uh, thanks for having me and looking forward to how things develop. And uh, let's see. Hopefully we'll meet again. That would be good. You've been listening to the Futurist Freelance Podcast brought to you by Solo.io, who offer compliance, taxation, invoicing and admin solutions for fiercely independent solopreneurs across the globe. From simply getting paid to launching a full EU-based limited company, Solo has you covered, thanks to Estonian e-residency and a superb suite of streamlined business software. If you enjoyed the show, please like, rate and comment, and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. 